So once we go live, yes, the participants have started joining in. Yes, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, who are joining us for today's webinar. On behalf of Wacom, we welcome all of you to the webinar on the market potential for natural cosmetics in Ghana. Uh, we always say we are bound uh, in lots and lots of natural cosmetic products, ingredients, whatever we may call it. And we would want to see how best we can find markets uh, for what we have. Um, this webinar is being organized by Wacom, the West Africa Competitiveness Program. The program is funded by the European Union across all the West, 16 West African countries. And in Ghana, it's implemented by UNIDO. We're focusing on three main value chains, on cosmetics and personal care products. And today's webinar falls within the cosmetic cluster. Then we have fruits, mango and pineapple. We have cassava and its derivatives. All attempts of this project is to enhance the competitiveness of the Ghanaian products so that whatever we have will be able to sell into the market and gain income and also develop our marketing potential as a country. Today's webinar, as usual, is being organized so we would have interaction, virtual interaction with the stakeholders within the cosmetic subsector. Due to COVID and its associated challenges, we are unable to meet face to face. And thanks to technology, we are able to use what we have at our disposal to reach as many people as possible. And today for this webinar, we have distinguished ladies and gentlemen to share their experience, to tell us about the market potential for natural cosmetics in Ghana. And also we have other two members, Valerie and uh, Senor, to tell us about what they are doing. And then we have Gepa and AGI to also tell us what they have. So to start with, I will give a quick introduction of our main resource person, who is in the person of Lawrence Denzel Phillips. Yeah, um, so can you give me a wave, Denzel? Yes, that's Denzel. So Denzel is a, a medicinal and aromatic plant specialist. He's a British. He's a British citizen, and he's done a lot of work in the field of cosmetics. He specializes in design and implementation of new agro-business projects and joint ventures. His particular expertise in the field of medicinal aromatic plants, and so today he will guide us through and tell us what he has been doing. He's a co-founder, director of the Association of African Medicinal Plant Standards. I mean, if you visit the website, you will see a lot. He has a wide range of um, experience. Across, I would say he's a, a widely traveled man from Afghanistan, but I think to be of more interest, we know he's been in Burkina Faso, in Cameroon, in Congo, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Gambia, Ghana, in Europe, all over. He has so much to tell us. So we are really honored to have you join us to share your experience and knowledge in the sector with us. So welcome, Denzel. Then we have Senor Belli. Yeah, Senor is a co-founder of SICAF, which is a Ghana Limited, producers of Tama Cosmetics. Senor is recognized as a share expert. He was formerly a former vice president of the Global Share Alliance. He has over 10 years experience in consultancy in the share subsector. He's worked for a lot of things in share. I mean, when you say share up in Ghana, then Senor, you can't do without him. Uh, he has experience in manufacturing of natural cosmetics from certified organic share butter to soaps, moisturizers, balm, etc., etc. Interestingly, for those of us interested in the gender aspect, Senor has worked with over 10,000 women. That's a lot. And local consultants across uh, West Africa, especially Ghana, Nigeria, and the others. So Senor, please give us a wave so that everybody see. Then we also have um, Valerie. Valerie will be talking to us, also sharing her experience with us. She runs the brand, the award-winning brand, um, luxury brand R&R, &R, which was opened in 2010. Well, she tells her, hers is an interesting story. Those of us who like stories as part of our marketing product. Um, since the birth of her first daughter, she wanted something to take care of the daughter's skin. You know, you want babies to have shine, gloom uh, skin that you, when you see the baby will be apt. So she decided to search and find something as a, somebody who likes nature and beauty products. 
then through her enthusiast, uh, enthusiastic nature, she worked around the clock and she was able to come up with something very natural that she would also share her experience with us. So Valerie also kindly give us a wave. Yes, we thank you for being with us and spending time with us. Then we have our own uh, mother, our own sister, who sits at the GEPA, being the person of Mrs. Agnes A.J. Sam. She's the director of marketing at Ghana Export Promotion Authority. So everything marketing, we didn't miss the point. We really got the right person to be with us. She has a wide range of experience in cosmetics and she will share her experience. And most importantly, give us an overview of what GEPA does, what GEPA does for exporters and for all people interested in natural cosmetics, how they will be able uh, to run this business. So ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the WACOM team and on behalf of those listening to us, I extend a warm welcome to all of you and I believe we'll enjoy your presence and then we'll acquire a lot more knowledge from you going forward. So thank you very much. So for our listeners, for this morning, as I have said, it's all about cosmetics and natural cosmetics, natural ingredients. So to get Denzel to get to know us better, we're going to launch a, a small poll. So the poll will be launched on your, on your screens now. There are three questions. You usually keep it very short. The whole idea is to get a resource person to have a fair idea of the people he would be interacting with. So these are the three questions. What is your main product? Here we can have multiple choice. Is it share butter? Pure share butter, share base creams, share base hair products, oils, black soap, and others. You can take as many of these. There's a multiple choice. And then are you already exporting? If yes, let us know. And then we also would want to know if you are exporting already, which countries? or with geographical areas. So you can also give us multiple choice. Maybe it's to the European Union, maybe other African countries, Middle East, or somewhere else, you can please do. So we're waiting, once the results of the poll is in, I will announce it, and then thereafter, we move straight into presentation from Denzel. So we check in. We encourage as many of us as possible to answer the poll for us. Okay, so yes, the answers are coming fast and thick. Yes. In the next 10 seconds, if everybody is done, we would announce the results. So I encourage everybody so we don't keep delaying everybody, please go ahead and answer for us. We have 15 people so far, yes. Half of us have voted. Do we give five seconds for the other half to do? So we wrap up. It's in our own interest. Then he also helps uh, Denzel to know what he's talking about and who he's also dealing with. Okay, here we are. So for the first question, we realized that the main products for most of the people joining us is pure share products. And then so black soap and share products are the two leading products, all having 74.74%. Then you have share base cream, you have oil 63%, share base creams 58%, share-based products 42. So overwhelmingly, you realize that share-based products are on and others 21%. We have 58% of our respondents are not exporting, but 42 are exporting. So maybe I guess after Mrs. Agnes tells us the opportunities and support GEPA can offer, I guess in the coming years, we'll have more exporters. If you're already exporting, which geographical area do you export? Interestingly, we have 42% African, other African countries, 32 EU, 20%, 26 to the USA, 11% um, to the Middle East, and then 58 others. 
So our work is cut out for us. Denzel, the picture is clear. So you would now hand over to you. So for our audience and for those listening to us, we thank you all for joining us. Um, Valerie, Mrs. Agnes, and Jay Sam, Senor Pelli and myself will go now, we'll turn our screens off, our cameras off, and then Denzel, you have the floor to tell us, run us through the presentation. So Denzel, welcome, and thank you so much for having us, and then we'll enjoy your presence. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, yes, it's a great privilege for me to be here with you all in spirit, if not physically. Um, uh, I, I have a great love for Ghana, uh, and I have um, visited many times, both uh, by air, and but also many times across the border at Wa, um, driving across. It's one of my favorite drives to drive down from Wagadougou, where I had a project, uh, down to Wipe, where I had another project, uh, also involved with Shea, and I've been involved with the Shea industry for quite a long time. So. Um, I, I do know Ghana. I don't say I know it very, very well, but I, uh, I've traveled around. I have good friends in Ghana, and it's a place I love. Um, let me get on with it. A couple of people are sending me um, WhatsApp uh, people saying that they cannot see the screen. Is that possible? They can hear us, but they cannot see us. Uh, is there a technical problem there? Anyway, I'm going to start. Um, and we'll see how we get on. Uh, I hope we can. Also... Yeah, the screen is on now. The screen is on now. Okay. Yes. Um, and then Denzel, you may have to adjust your microphone a bit. You are a bit faint, so that we can hear you much louder. Better? This is, is better? better. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Fine. Um, all right. Uh, I'm trying to get. To... Okay. Let me get back to where I am. Okay. Yes. My name is Denzel Phillips, as uh, I've been well described. I've traveled a lot. I specialize in sustainable sourcing of sustainable raw materials and the development of new materials for the natural product industry. So I've worked right across essential oils, cosmetic raw materials, uh, natural remedies, herbal remedies, um, phytocosmetics, phytomedicines, anything that comes from the plant. Um, that is useful. I'm interested in natural colorings, all the things that we can use commercially for a plant based. I know very little about synthetic uh, cosmetics. I'm not an expert in it. And I'm not a, a, a formulator. While I work with a lot of wonderful formulators, but, um, I, that, I'm not the right person if you want to ask very technical questions on stability, on um, toxicity but I do understand what is required, but just so everybody understands. So um, just a quick outline of the presentation structure, a little bit about categories and definitions, then a, a review of the, the sort of how does the market look? What does it look like, the world market, the European market? I then want to discuss about ingredient potential, local ingredients, what are the trends, world trends in ingredients? Uh, then something which I did specifically for this uh, webinar and for the report, which is to try and explain to people to, that they need to understand where they are in the business at the moment, in the totality of the global cosmetic industry and where they might want to be and where the, the various steps along the road. I hope it's not a, 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 a demoralizing presentation in that way, but it it does just show you how big it is and how far many of you got to go. But um, it's a very exciting road at many of you. I want to talk about the diaspora. Um, it's an interesting area because in many ways that's my results show that Ghanaians and Nigerians living abroad are often your main competitors and I want to discuss that with you. Maybe it's not just a simple little one. And then say something about branding and packaging. So um while we've just seen and heard that most of you who are attending this talk and most of you in Ghana are working in a relatively small area, something doing soaps, doing creams, um, doing body butters, 
the cosmetic industry is huge. I don't want to go into too much in terms of definitions. Um, we see the cosmetic industry uh, including fragrance. Um, we will see some categorization. Um, but here are just some of the, the product areas that we are looking at. Now, I don't know of any company, in fact, I, there are very few companies in the whole of Africa that make the complete range of cosmetics that are possible. So um, I think that's one of the first things you all need to understand. There's loads of products that you can get involved with. Most of you are involved in one tiny corner of the cosmetic industry. That doesn't make it bad or good. It's just a, a reality. Um, it, it shows you that there's a potential there um, in many, many different areas. As you know, with COVID around, everybody has rushed into looking at trying to see if they can adapt themselves and make sanitary washes. And looking at that sector, and you'll find right across the world, all the cosmetic companies have re-kitted out their product lines in order to have a buyer. It's hygienic gels and, and products like that. How long this will go on for, whether that will become a major feature of the industry, uh, it's difficult to tell because they're basically cheap products um, and it's, it's volume that is required there. Um, I, I, so the next slide is basically, let's move into the size and the scale of this industry. It's very, very big. Um, I think before I say that, I need to mention that cosmetics, uh, as I say, uh, normally in, in the definition includes the fragrance sector, and um, particularly fragrances that are used in the cosmetics. Um, we also have another subsector of the cosmetic sector, which is related to beauty supplements, what we call beauty from within, an area I'm very interested in. In fact, I've organized a whole conference about this in, uh, Germany some years ago, beauty from within, the, the fact that skin care and uh, body care is also about diet, it's about nutrition, it's about what you eat, you've got to have it right, if you, because most of the problems of your skin appear because of bad diet or some health problems, circulation problems, so if you don't fix those, however much you put on the outside, you've got to look at the inside now. Again, this is an area I don't believe there's a single company or very, very few companies in West Africa that even have attempted to look at this whole concept of without and within uh, body products that you would consume and it can be functional food that help enhance your skin care and, and the way you look. So that's an area. But uh, that's not normally counted in the figures. The other big problem for you lot is what is a natural cosmetic? I could spend all this seminar talking to you about this. Uh, it's a hotly debated subject uh, to such an extent that the uh, ISO, the International Standards Organization, which is linked to the United Nations, was forced to try and develop a, a, a categorization and it's, it's in, an, in an appendix of my report as to what they defined as a natural product but basically in most countries, particularly in America, anybody can say anything, my product's natural. I've got a natural product. It, it may mean that you've got 10% naturals in it, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50, all 100%. Very difficult to make a very sophisticated cosmetic with 100% natural raw materials. Almost impossible, but it is possible, but it's very, very difficult. So what is the definition? Uh, I think, um, you know, it's not a subject that we want to look at now, but it is very important to you because you may need to use this as a, a way of pushing yourself forward because there's a big trend towards natural. So if you can prove that your products really are 100% natural or even 90% natural and you get it certified, you're far more likely to get it on the shelf than if you don't. I'll come back to that later. So let's look at some of the figures. Um, Europe and this includes the European Union and uh, places like Norway, Switzerland, Sweden, and shortly. Uh, 
is by far the biggest market in the world for cosmetics. Um, it has uh, some of the highest per capita, because obviously there are two things, there's the, the total volume, and then there's which people use most cosmetics per capita. Um, Germany, so 78 billion, we're talking billions here, all these figures are in billions of dollars, 78.6 billion dollars worth of cosmetics in Europe, um, making it by far the largest market. Uh, with, with countries like Germany very high up per capita wise, um, but, but very varied in the use of cosmetics per capita. Next largest market, the United States, um, and the biggest single country market. And obviously that's very attractive. You've got one real single market with free flow of trade right across. And uh, Hence, it's the powerhouse in many ways. Uh, there's lots of things going on and we need to particularly look at the black American market. It's a huge, huge subcomponent because it's the, outside of Africa, obviously it's the largest population of people of color is, is in the United States. China, a big market, um, growing market, and if you combine all of Asia, it, it's, it's getting bigger and bigger. Japan, a very interesting market, very sophisticated market, but with some very strange things about it. For instance, the Japanese don't like fragrances, they don't use them very much. They're very heavily into cosmetics, very sophisticated ones, but they are very low users of fragrance products, and uh, deodorants and uh, eau de cologne sprays. The big new country is Brazil. And if I were a Ghanaian and I really was looking long distance forward, that's the place I would get myself a ticket when COVID is over, go and visit Brazil. Because Brazil is lots of action and one of the world's biggest natural cosmetic companies. Natura is based in Brazil. Natura have now bought Body Shop, they've bought quite a few other companies. They are now a very major global player, um, if not the biggest global player in natural cosmetics. Uh, they're a very interesting company. They develop products from the Amazon and they have, but they also are involved. They have a company called Aesop, which they recently bought, which is an Australian essential oil company, a very fine company uh, to be involved with. Uh, so Brazil is a country to watch. Very much so. Um, South Korea, very again, that whole, uh, very similar to Japan. Um, and uh, interesting, India, obviously a very big population, mainly a very new country to get involved in the cosmetic sector, but has to grow uh, as their incomes grow. Um, so where are the big markets? So um, if you stick them all together, uh, if we look at the regional structure, uh, then Asia's the largest. If we look in terms of um, individual countries, Europe is the largest. And you can see Africa doesn't even get a showing on its own, I'm afraid, in this diagram. It's stuck with the Middle East, uh, but it's, it's probably 2% of that 3%. Uh, but that's an important thing to list. Uh, this the figures is 2014, it's probably grown, but we're still, Africa is still very much a very minor, as yet, consumer of cosmetic products, um, but with huge potential. If you stick the two European, Eastern European and Western European, you've got 22 plus 7, so you've got 29, it's still very, very big. And I've already told you about Latin America. Let's look at the product breakdown. This is very important to you. Very important you understand this. Um, it will differ. Hello, Denzel. Yes. Uh, it looks like the sound keeps fluctuating and it's, it gets faint. So if you can reposition the, the mic, yes. Okay. So that we can. Yeah. Yeah. Is that better? It's okay. better. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll start again. 
Um, I'm just going to repeat that. Yes, Asia is the largest, uh, followed by Western Europe in terms of geography. Uh, we talked about North America. Moving to the diagram on the left, I suppose it's next, yeah, um, which is about the product categorization that is very important for you all to understand. What are the segments that are important? So and this applies, you'll see the differences, but basically this is a global situation and in almost every country. Skin care is the dominant aspect, the dominant feature of the cosmetic industry. Here you see it as 35% and in different countries it ranges between 30 and 40% of the market is in skin care. Uh, and that's where obviously you people with shea butter as a key natural raw material. Uh, let me just go back a little bit. This, these figures I'm first showing you are of total cosmetics, natural and conventional. So these are not figures of just natural. So this is the breakdown, but the breakdown is very similar. I'll give you some figures later about what the size of the natural but just so you know, these are figures for the total cosmetic industry. Uh, hair care coming in second. Now, if this was an African country, probably the hair care would be even bigger. Hair care is a very important sector. Um, and uh, as you know, you have some very interesting players in that as well, and very great interest in hair care in Africa. And this to me is a an area where I would be putting a lot of emphasis. Uh, makeup, 17%. Um, recently heard about an interesting platform, Makeup Ghana, um, uh, developing and pushing that sector, but not a big sector for naturals. There is very limited amount of natural makeup products on the market. Uh, it's a new area. Um, it's an important area for new R&D work and anybody who's got some interesting ideas to develop that, I would seriously recommend they do look at that. Fragrances, as we know, um, yeah, they're a big sector, sector and important, the perfume sector, but relative to the total, it's still quite small. And the hygiene sector, post-COVID, this will have grown a lot. But here we're mainly talking about antiperspirants and deodorants, but it's still an important sector, but it will have grown a lot. If we move on down, we're going to move to Europe, because I think most of you will be looking to Europe as your major international market. Uh, we'll talk about Africa in a minute, but let's have a look at the European market. Again, we're talking total cosmetics, not natural. So Germany is the largest market. That is not surprising because it's the largest country since it um, was unified. It's like that, over 18 million plus people, 30 billion euros, 13.8 billion. France, number two, UK, number three, Italy, number four. So uh, that is very typical for all the natural products field, that ranking. Germany, physically the biggest. So a lot of this is related to population. Italy, a very interesting market, very difficult market to get into. But Italian women are really, really interested in cosmetics. And are very great women, very, very knowledgeable. Okay. Um, so let's look at the segmentation, how it's broken up the European market. This is an even more detailed um, breakdown. Um, you can see that um, there's some interesting product areas that we have fragrance, we have hair care, very important body care, um, and uh, sun care. Now, uh, again, this is where we see major differences. Sun care is a very interesting and very profitable area to be in, but it's unlikely that many of you will go into that sector for two reasons. One reason is that um, it's a very technically advanced sector to get into because um, all the screening 
HPF, the screening materials are very difficult, the testing is very difficult, and it's a very expensive product to launch. And B, you're not really into sunbathing locally, and you're not, it's not an issue, so uh, there are not many Ghanaians or indeed West Africans who are really involved in this, this sector. And unless your tourism industry got really big, I'm not sure it would be going into, but in Europe, it's very important. And even in places like South Africa, it's, it's gaining in importance. Um, fragrance is very interesting, and I'll come back to that again, that all of you, most cosmetics are used fragrances. And obviously, if you want to be a natural cosmetic, you want to use natural fragrances. You don't want to ruin the image of your product by using a synthetic fragrance in what is otherwise a lovely natural cosmetic product. Now those are difficult to get both in Ghana and in general in West Africa, good natural fragrance materials, essential oils, and hence it's something that all of you need to have a look at and we can see if we can get more in people interested in that in, in West Africa. The, the, the countries are different. And that's the other thing to, to realize that while, you know, they're legally speaking in Europe, you know, there's quite a lot of unification. Cosmetics is a very thing which is very culturally orientated. There's a lot of specific cultural features that are different in different countries. The there's image, a... Yes? Please, the sound. Uh, it makes following the discussion, the presentation, uh, difficult. So I don't know whether you can also check the sound on your. You know, I'm the, try uh, something else. Yes. Is that better? This is better. Yes. All right. I'm not doing it through my headphones now. Yes. And this is far better. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so I'm sorry if there's been sound problems. I understand. So I, I was trying to say that. Um, Cosmetics are very culturally orientated things. It's a very personal thing, and hence religion, culture, uh, and, and national characteristics make it very different what the market looks like in different places. And that's something that you need to understand if you're going to try and market in Europe. It's quite difficult to market always the same things in the same places. And that's also to do with the cultural mix in the different countries but here you will see these one two three four five different countries all have very different breakdown the cake if you like is cut in different ways skin care is much more important in germany and they take a lot of interest in skin care in germany um, whereas in italy and france personal hygiene products are very big in spain they're very really really crazy about cosmetic about perfume and there's a very big perfume industry there's a lot of interest in perfume in eau de cologne sprays and you'll see that perfume makes up a very big proportion of the, of the business um and 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 whereas other sectors like skincare is not so important then uh, these it's partly to do with the weather it's partly to do with yeah, as I say, cultural things. Um, I think you'll find that skin care is more uh, something that is uh, also linked to, you know, how much sun there is. Uh, in Spain, it's sunny a lot. We, you know, we don't. So, as those skin care products include sun care, uh, you'll find that there's big differences. Here are, the, here are the actual figures rather than a, a, a chart. You see again, 20% of the EU market in skincare, 26%, $20 billion, 26% of the market in skincare. Um, hair care, toiletries, fragrances, and decorative cosmetics. Now, um, decorative cosmetics is very big uh, in Africa but almost always it's been dominated by imported materials. It's very synthetic orientated in companies like MAC, which you've all heard of, I'm sure, MAC, which is part of the Estee Lauder group. 
are very big in many, many countries. I don't know whether they're big in Ghana, but you can tell me that later. But I know in Nigeria and certainly in South Africa, they're doing well. They're very strong and in Kenya. Um, but decorative cosmetics is something that's growing and uh, a lot of interest in it, particularly in Nigeria, I've seen. Um, the fragrance sector, I've told you, yeah, that is, is broken down into the, the synthetic sector and the natural essential oil sector um, with natural cosmetics, natural fragrances being more and more important. So where do we sell cosmetics then? That's a very important thing for you to understand and know. Uh, in the old days, we used to sell cosmetics. Really, there were only two major outlets. You'd either buy them in a big department store. There would be a cosmetic. You'd go into a big department store like Harrods or Harvey Nichols or you know, Printemps in France or um, one of the big department stores. And they would have a big area where, where, and they still do, of course. And for most of you, the vision is if you went to, came on a visit to Europe, or even if you went to the States, Henry Bendales or the big, that's probably where you would first go to if you wanted to buy cosmetics, because you see them all the different famous brands in one, one part of a department store. But as you can see, it's actually only 15% of the market. Um, but on the other hand, I can say that department stores are more likely to have high-end products and all the big and famous brands, the top-end brands, the Chanel's, the Clarins, these are often only found in department stores or specialist stores. So it's an imp uh, while it's not big, it's important it's where the luxury and the premium brands go. As you can see though, supermarkets and hypermarkets though, uh, and f drug stores, drug stores are the main, 57% of the market is now into pharmacies and drug stores. Um, this is very, very important to understand. In the UK, we are dominated by boots. Boots is a very big, actually German-owned company now, which has in every high street. Um, and we have Superdrug and we have chains in every high street. Now to get into these shops is very, very difficult. But once you're in there, you've got a huge market potential, huge. So they have central buying in many places. Um, it's tough, you have to pay to have um, promotional areas for yourself to get on the shelf at all. You have to pay um, large sums of money just to get them to show you. If you don't perform well, they'll throw you off. But they have a lot of power, as you can see. And um, in Germany, we have a, a group, when I lived in Germany, called Douglas. Now, Douglas is a very special drugstore. It's a cosmetic chain and it's very important and it dominates the market in many ways in the same way um, that um, it, they do in other countries. Now we have 26% is in these specialist cosmetics and perfumery stores of which the most famous one for you people will be Sephora. So Sephora has become a very important and powerful um, company worldwide and obviously that has dominated uh, Douglas I mentioned but, but both these come very important if you can get yourself in into a Sephora you know I don't uh, you really you know sort of made it in in, in the sense that you, you have a huge potential because it'll go right across the world um, now, obviously, the other area is online. Um, online is where most of you are at the moment internationally. Uh, and hence, what is happening online is very, very important for you to understand. It used to be very easy to get online because there weren't many of you doing it and there were um, 
the costs of getting online were not that big or getting yourself known. Now, particularly because of COVID-19, online is becoming more and more expensive and the area, and so that figure of less than 10% is probably now t probably 20%, if not more. And it's getting more and more expensive to get up there because there's just so many players now who are switching their emphasis to online. So you're in a much more crowded area than you were before. So those of you who are reliant on online, um, you've, got to, you, you've got to think very hard now in order to get your products competitive. Uh, one, the, the direct selling, I think is very important. Uh, and it, while it's still there only below 5%, I think um, the door-to-door -door Avon calling, Avon is the biggest and dominant player in the cosmetic sector, although um, there are others. Um, indeed, there are Mary Kay is another one. And in the, in the perfumery sector, there are also huge companies like Young Living and doTERRA who are multi-level marketing companies that are now actually very, very important. Um, and to consider working or being in, the, in these platforms is also a, a very interesting area because you can become a supplier and also a seller at the same time. Uh, one other area I wanted to mention is about beauty salons, hairdressing, indeed, all these other specialist barbers shops for men's that is becoming an interesting niche area for you to look at to sell in other words if rather than trying to sell into a traditional department store or drugstore you look at these smaller beauty salons and are more and more a place to get products because obviously if you're in there and you're having a treatment or you're having your hair done and you like the product, you say, I want to buy it, I want to take it away. And, and you'll find that more and more salons, particularly in Europe, also have a, a, a shop with very selective products. It's obviously not large volumes, but they like to push products. And obviously the, the staff there, uh, you know, are going to give recommendations towards those products. So that's quite an interesting area to get into. And people who, and I would guess this is an important area to be in in places like Ghana itself and all across Africa that actually shops within a shop and this is also important when we look at the spa and wellness industry those of you who have products the spa shop in a hotel is a very important place to be put put your products a very interesting place to put your products because as I say there are people the therapist will be encouraging the people they work with, their clients, would you like to buy, take home one of the products we're using? So um, think very hard about what type of outlet do you want to try and sell in and understand that outlet. This is a very superficial, I could go on for on each section it's important you realize that there are many different ways now in which you can sell your products. This is a, just another way of looking at it. Again, differences between countries. So in one country, see in England, all these sort of big uh, discount stores uh, that are around, they're very important uh, in terms of selling that um, are, are cosmetics whereas in France it doesn't exist at all and in Germany it's not important um, whereas um, direct selling as you can see is very important in France door to door and yet it's not very important in the UK so department stores as you can see very important in both Germany and the UK but in France it really is not important so you have to know each country and understand it before you market in it. And just because you say, well, it's all part of the European Union, or it's all part of Europe, it's all going to be the same. 
That is not the case. The different markets are very different. Let's move on to Africa. Now, the first thing to realize is there's very little information, very poor data. Nobody gives out many figures. The trade data on cosmetics is not good. Uh, only South Africa has serious data on it. And so while these figures are roughly right, because I've looked at various sources, it's very difficult to get overall information. But I, I, I think the, 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 the list here is pretty much correct in terms of you know, which are the major players, South Africa, number one, and certainly number one in the manufacturing sector, Nigeria, a very big consuming market, but more and more important in manufacturing. Egypt, a very huge country with very large population as well, and then a serious player. And then Kenya moving very fast. Now where Ghana is, I would like to know, but I think it will be somewhere along with Morocco, down there at about 1 billion. But I think I would like to know from the audience or from our guests, my hosts, what their view is as to where Ghana fits into that, that table. The only country I could get information on segmentation of the market is South Africa. And I guess that figure is pretty much similar right across Africa, that hair care is the biggest sector. Uh, it's debatable, but I, you know, my gut feeling is that hair care uh, is really big right across the continent. Uh, and it is surprising how few of you knowing that to be the case, and I'm sure you all do because every African woman I know spends a huge amount of time over going to the hairdresser, being, talking about hair, and it's, it's a really big thing. How few natural product areas, natural cosmetic products are being developed in Africa for that sector. And anybody who goes into that, I think has a real good prospect in the continent itself. Hygiene products, I think that's understandable in the weather uh, and skin care. So those are the three areas certainly that I would focus on and I would not get directly into fragrances. I'm uh, trying to sell a perfume, a brand of perfume. There are very few that have been out there uh, have made it. It's very difficult to compete with the big, uh, the big players. But fragrance ingredients for these other products, for hair care, for personal hygiene, for deodorants, and for skincare, yes, that's a very important subsector to get involved with. Uh, I, I like feedback from the audience on that one. Okay, um, I suppose everybody wants to know about e-commerce. Where is it going? Uh, what the look of it? Uh, Here's some predictions from an American agency, uh, and they have been thrown out of the window probably by COVID. They probably have been accelerated. So the, the study was done in 2018. Huge growth predicted even without COVID-19. Now this will have expanded very much, very fast and very, but the key area here, if you're going to get into that sector and you want to be big using online sales, it's very difficult for new companies to get into there because, where, because people will tend to look for the names that they know if they've never heard the name of your brand. It would only by chance often that they would find you. So a very important area for established companies, but to get you know, onto the radar screen to get into the Google search engine, to be up there in the first page is a very, very tough process. Um, but it's, it, it's got to be, and the other key area is when lots of people look online, but all the evidence is that 90% of them don't buy. 
So the key is not to get people to look at your site, but actually to buy on it. It's much more difficult. And normally it's how difficult it is to, to move around your site and also the whole issue of having to pay. How do you pay for the product? And how long will it take to get the product to the market? People are very impatient. And if you don't have a distribution network within the region that you're trying to sell in, you're going to find it very difficult. Very few people are prepared to wait a two weeks or so for a cosmetic to arrive, unless it's something very, very special. They want it, they want it in three, four days, absolute maximum. And if you can't deliver it in that time, most of your people will go away. And if you can't buy it online, you don't have PayPal, and it doesn't work, you have to complicate the process of changing exchange rates. Um, it's, it's difficult. I just tried to send somebody some money in South Africa through TransferWise, which is a bank that I use. And that normally it takes a few hours for it to reach him. It didn't reach him because the, he has to fill in a form, in a government form, before they're allowed to send it. And because the client I got it didn't fill it in properly, it took another three days for him to fill in the home before I could give him his money even. So all these sorts of things, very, very important if you're going to focus on e-commerce, all the back end stuff, and finally customer services. People, although you're buying online, they want to talk to you. They want questions. They want to want people to answer. And if you've, if you've got an email and it sits there for a week, nobody, you know, they want to be able to talk online. They want to chat to you. They want to have people answering questions. And if you can't have those backup services, you'll find it very difficult. But these things can be done just as well in Africa as they can be done anywhere else. Now we're moving on a little bit more into natural cosmetics or organic. Now, the beauty of organic cosmetics in terms of quantities of numbers is that we actually know the, the volume, the actual uh, numbers and the size is relatively well known because there's certification. These things are certified and hence they're traceable. So we're pretty sure of our numbers in terms of the, the growth or the size of the organ, organic cosmetic sector. In Europe, certainly in America, where 90% of organic stuff is certified, we are much less certain of the size of the natural cosmetic market. And every of the very expensive market research reports, and I would remind you, you'll, if you go online and look for information that I'm giving you here, most of these studies, like this one, Grandview Research, this is like a $10,000 research document. And this is just one or two slides from it. They're very, very expensive. They keep them to themselves. So it's very difficult to get a lot of free information about the volume. But this is the American market. Again, skincare is very important and hair care taking the dominant roles and growing fast. The relative importance of organics uh, is there now. Very few of you in Ghana have yet gone to organic certification. I hope Tama will explain a little bit about what they do and how their experiences with it. Because mainly in the local market, nobody will pay extra for that. So no, very few people who sell mainly in the local market they don't find it has any traction, any value. So, but when they go into the European market or the American market, it may be just one extra reason why they can get themselves on the shelf and other people can't, is if they can have organic certification. So it's something you need to consider quite carefully. I mentioned to you this issue about natural nature, natural, what's natural? I just put this up for, to make you laugh, if you like. Um, that is the chemical composition of a cup of tea. And if you saw it on the side of a cup of tea, you probably wouldn't drink it. 
but that's the truth. Um, why are we so fixated on the word natural? What does it mean to us? Are we really better off? Is it safer? Is it uh, healthier? Uh, is it environmentally more? These are these are as many questions as not automatic answers. But um, I see a lot of products in all over West Africa which say, oh, all natural, all this. There's no certification, there's no judgment as to whether it's true or not. Um, and, and you have to just believe what they're saying, but it doesn't necessarily mean it is better either. So there's a lot of hype surrounding the whole, the whole expression. So this is a, a definition that you may want to read it's 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 a good one any material is harvested mined collected which may have subsequently been washed decolorized distilled fractionated ground milled separated to leave a chemical chemicals that would be detectable in the original source material very it, 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 it's 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 a uh, it's an issue that we could spend a lot of time talking about. Natural cosmetics are a, still a small component of the market, as we will just see in a minute. Here are some of the most famous brands. Um, many of them are German. Germany has dominated this market for many years and been in it. Dr. Hauschka, uh, a very well known brand. Um, there is a trade fair every year. Um, which is part of the BioFac organic um, it, it, or organic food fair. One section of that is devoted entirely to natural cosmetics. Um, now, uh, looking at that list, I expect most of you have never seen those products, never even heard of them, because they're not big international they are international brand but they're specialist and they are not commonly found in your duty free or on the radio or in places where a lot of you go when you're traveling so um th that is the case it's, it's still a specialist area but very very fast growing and with very good profit margins now, one of the things that is really important in that whole issue of natural cosmetics is people want to ask questions. They want to know, and there's so many stickers and labels now attached to many products that we are all, many of us are very confused. We want a certification on natural and the most important one in Europe is called Cosmos. Uh, it's a certification program which runs right across Europe. A lot of us are very concerned about cruelty to animals and animal testing. Now in Europe, animal testing has been banned by the European Union. So this has become law. No animal testing is allowed in Europe for cosmetics. It is allowed for, for pharmaceuticals, but it is not allowed for cosmetics. So in Europe, all cosmetics are beauty free. Are, are, we don't need the proof. But in China, it's the other way around. You've got to use animal testing. So they insist on animal testing. And companies like one of the companies I work with, uh, Neil's Yard Remedies, they refuse to sell in China because they're very dedicated to uh, not uh, having animal testing. So they can't sell in that market. Now, the other area that is really important, veganism in food stuff has also moved into cosmetic field. And vegan cosmetics is one of the most fast growing areas. That is cosmetics are free of all, sin all animal materials, animal based materials in them. And uh, as a result, uh, there's a lot of looking at that growth area. And an area which is important, I think in Ghana to think about is palm oil. Palm oil is the largest 
cosmetic ingredient in the world, probably. Bigger than Shea, incredibly important. If you look at the totality of the industry, there's hardly any product with no palm oil. And palm oil free products are being sought after, but more important is actually our, the issue is not so much should it be free of palm oil completely, but is the palm oil sustainable? Uh, and my recommendation to people here in, in this audience in Ghana is most Ghanaian palm oil is small farmer. It is not large um, plantations which have been ripped out of the forest. There's been a huge attack worldwide on the use of cutting down huge plantations of mature forests to grow plant trees. Now, if you can prove that your palm oil is respects is sustainable and obviously most small farmer palm oil is you can use it and people are happy to use it but they want to know where your palm oil came from so it's, it's an ingredient that actually i didn't see being used very much uh, despite the fact as i say if you're looking globally it's massively used um, uh, but you've got to either you either make a thing and say it's palm oil free if you want to be in europe and they will or you want to show that it's RSPO, which is the certification showing that it is sustainable. Okay, we're moving on now. Denzel, you have... How many more minutes have I got? Max, um, seven minutes. Okay, yeah, that's fine. I'm nearly there. The natural cosmetic industry. Okay, so we're now looking at, at naturals. We're looking at this sector. Germany, as I just told you, the most important market. France, the number two. Italy. So that is also a message for you people. Most of you who have links probably in Europe have links with the UK. UK is not the major market for natural cosmetics. Uh, Germany is far, far bigger and France is bigger again. So if any of you can develop or have languages or the ability to go across the channel and look there, you should be doing so because it's a very much larger proportion of the total market is in naturals. There are markets, English market is important, but it's not nearly as big as Germany and France and Italy. Now in America, just looking at the breakdown and this is typical also for Europe. This is natural beauty care, 43% skin care. So again, skin care products are the one in which most natural uh, cosmetics are made up. And so those of you who are focusing on that area, you have a, a, a much greater chance than if you're into, say, makeup. And you can see that. I told you makeup is still a very small area. Okay, I don't want to make, I mentioned right at the beginning about beauty for women, beauty supplements, just one area which you could think about but n nobody really has looked at. African remedies, beauty from within. What, what do people eat to make them look beautiful? Think about that question, what I've told you. A fun cosmeceuticals, that is, a very big buzzword in, in, in uh, America, more so than in Europe, but very important. A cosmeceutical, this has come from pharmaceutical, a cosmeceutical is a functional cosmetic. And again, very, very few people in Africa are doing clinical testing to prove that any of their products have any functional characteristics against eczema. They, they can, some evidence of what they're doing, they might be you know, evening out blotches on the skin, it might be removal of pimples, it might be um, emoluments to hydrate the skin, but having a function, if you can prove that your product functionally works, you're going to get a huge, be able to add value to your product very greatly, but you have to invest in getting testing done to prove that. So that is something uh, again, it's a long-term thing, but those of you at the more sophisticated end, 
that could be quite useful. And things like black soap, I've never seen any studies as to whether black soap actually has any um, specific merits uh, which could be proven. And I think we should look at that. Now, the biggest growth area in the trend in cosmetics, and I've been looking at series of, is the whole issue of green and clean cosmetics. Now, <laughs> clean cosmetics and green cosmetics are ones which are environmentally friendly, which are free from, free from parabens, free from many different chemical ingredients. So this is the fastest growing sector because if you can, and this does not mean that they're necessarily natural and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're organic, but the fastest growing segment of the market is in fact the clean cosmetic sector. And it's very important and, and everybody is looking at, there's no labeling, but I, would beseech all of you to have a look at that because most of your artisanal products use very few preservatives, use very few uh, synthetic ingredients because you can't get hold of them. And they're very, uh, I don't think many of you are using parabens or uh, glycerin or all these other products, thousands of products that are out there, which are used to, to stabilize, to give a greater shelf life on cosmetics. But if you can show this and, 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 and market this concept, that you're green and you're clean, this is a big, big factor at the moment. I think we mentioned about organic. Most of you are organic by default. There are a few organic producers. Um, Savannah Fruits, for instance, it's shea butter is organic, it's certified organic. If you're using certified organic, it's important to show it and to say it, made with organic ingredients. And I told you about vegan, and I think all your products are vegan. So these, these labels you can develop and use for your own advantage, because basically you're, you're not there. So I'm just very quickly gonna go on to the final bit of the thing. I've mentioned most of these things here. Traceability, people want to know where the products come from. They want to know, are they cruelty free? Um, local sourcing, all these things are really important. Um, we're, we're interested to know more and more about who grows them, who processes them, where it's from, how they're used traditionally. The more the story, the better the story, the better you have a chance of selling it. So that's the basic message. Your story is very important, but it must be real. It must be a real story, not a made up story. We've all got a grandmother who had some recipe in here, but it needs to be a little bit more substantiated and a little bit more technical, if you like. Um, one of the things I was asked to talk about is a lot of you are still looking at ingredients and not going into value-added cosmetics. And I think it's important that we all discuss this a bit, is what are the advantages of moving away from just doing a cos you know, a raw material, nuts, shea butter or collecting shea nuts, or it, it may be baobab leaves or baobab, it might be moringa seed or moringa leaf. And, and making them into a product. The, obviously, it's, people think, oh, well, it's automatically, we should all be doing value-added products. And uh, in general, that's correct. But on the other hand, um, there, there's a downside. Um, and, and I think we need to look at the advantages and disadvantages of just staying with ingredients. The advantage of just being an ingredient supplier is you don't need a lot of capital. You don't need to invest very much. You can do this, as I say, alongside your family work, your farm work. You can have a big family. It's not a full-time job. And that's really important to many people. They can do it off season. So it, it can be mainly done outdoors. They don't need to have a factory or a workshop. Most of that work 
can be done outside. And again, so that's, they don't need to build or to own facilities. They can use their family, they can use their family labor to help them. You don't need skilled labor to do it. You don't require a lot of education. You don't need to purchase very much. In fact, all our evidence of Dr. Peter Lovett, who I think may be listening to it, and I did some work looking at Shea industry is that actually, if you do start purchasing a lot of ingredients or using a lot of hard labor to do your collection of your Shea or making your butter, your margin, your actual profit from doing it is very small, very small indeed. So uh, actually to move from just collecting nuts to doing Shea butter looks very attractive on the face of it. I'm bound to make more money. I'm bound to be richer. Is not always the case. Unless if you certainly, if you start calculating your time and the time of your children, the time of your husband, the time of your mother, all the amount of time that's put into stuff. So um, we need to look carefully if you want to go into the value added sector you need to see whether you can you can you can develop it what are the ingredients you could use because one of the things i've only got a few minutes one of the things that was really yes. came across to me was that very few people are using more than shea butter and a few other ingredients very very few of you there's a lot of ingredients available in ghana and yet very few of you seem to be using them in your ranges and i just Put down a few here. Cocoa. Cocoa butter is a wonderful raw material. It's not easy to get in Ghana. There's no organic cocoa butter as far as I'm aware. Um, I, and it's expensive and it's difficult to get. Coconut. The very important raw material in cosmetic coconut. Virgin coconut oil. It, it's there but not widely. We discussed about palm. Boba. It's everywhere. It's a big interesting area. Uh, we, some of you are beginning to use it, but there's not a lot. And then these other things, niger seed, nigella, you know, black niger seed, papaya, avocado. You have a lot of raw materials. You also have a lot of essential oil raw materials. Yeah, so Denzel will be wrapping up. Yeah. So Your concluding you, marks. Yeah. So you, you, can, you can use many more raw materials than you are at present if we can find people who are prepared to distill them, clean them, package them, and make them available to you. So I, I, I recommend you all move in that direction. Okay, end of story. Thank you very much. Well, Thank you very much, Denzel. It's been, I know you have a lot more to say. Um, the, all presentations for our listeners will be on the Wacom website. You would always have access to the full presentation. Uh, at this stage, we want to thank Denzel so much for giving us these insights into the natural cosmetics um, products potential. At this moment, may I please ask them, um, Johnson and then um, Mrs. Agnes, AJ Sam of Kepa to turn on their cameras and then we'll take a few questions. Um, thank you and for being in the background and listening um, to us. Having heard what um, Denzel has given, the market's potential, we would want to know, we saw the market segmentation and the lack of information. So for GEPA and AGI, I would want to find out what you are doing to support uh, the industry with market information. Right. Who goes first? Any of you can go. Gepa or AGI? Gepa, you can right. start. Yes. You are TPO. <laughs> oh, they're very, very informative presentation. That's very good. Thank you. And so, um, uh, please, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I can hear you, so it means everybody's hearing you, Claire. Okay. All right. And so, um, um, I want to say that uh, Gepa is very, very pleased to be part of this program. Uh, because we consider the share industry as one of the most important areas for um, us in the export sector. I believe everybody knows already about Ghana Export Promotion Authority, so I'm not going to go 
into what we do and what we have done. But um, I just want to take it from the point of the market. Okay. So um, when it comes to market, uh, marketing share products, um, we do a bit of backward integration in that uh, we like to go back a bit to uh, the production because uh, you need to get um, sustainable production to be able to um, get a um, product for the export market. And so what we're doing is that um, we realize that uh, the industry is very labor intensive and then and, and it's mostly dominated by women, especially at the production uh, side. And then um, we have found out that um, they have a lot of challenges, uh, particularly in, in the picking of the nuts. And so um, we have been in the past and even now been supporting them with the correct ingredients so that uh, they will be able to do the correct or um, a sizable amount of production. So recently, I think less than a month ago, just this month, we went to Borga because we know that they usually work in associations and groups. And we provided them with some uh, very essential working gear. And they included overalls and boots and then gloves and any other things to make the picking very easy for them. Okay, so that is um, for uh, the picking so that they can get um, the correct um, product. Now, knowing the, uh, the importance, the economic importance of share and its role on um, women and then the unemployed, um, we have also included it in the national export strategy. Okay, in 2013, we had one, we launched one, which barely took off because of some issues. So this time, the Ministry of Trade, um, together with um, other institutions being driven by Ghana Export Promotion Authority, we came together to see um, how we can have a holistic production and export or marketing program for the sector. And so the NEDS, that site is called the National Export Development Strategy. Um, we have gained approval uh, at the level of the ministry and is currently at cabinet, you know, um, receiving the federal approval so that we can um, 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 implement it. And a lot of the implementation plans have to do with uh, marketing support for the industry. But even so, um, we are still doing marketing support for them because our role is to develop and promote exports. And so uh, we often take them on trade shows and trade missions. Um, in the past, we were doing mostly generalized fairs. So we, would, we identify people with products, then we take them to general fairs. Well, that is good for new people. Um, those who are now, those who are now have products, as I saw from the statistics, a lot about 52% are yet to export. Okay? Yeah. So for that group of people, we like them to at least know how the market is like, just to have a right. taste of um, the consumer preferences, how, what buyers are looking for. So a lot of them we take to the generalized phase. And I've seen a few of your participants, I don't want to mention names now. Last year, we took them to, um, to a, a general program like that in Chicago. And then we also took um, them to, I think Kenya, no, no Kenya, um, Ethiopia this year. Okay. Um, it's part of their preparation to know the market. It's part, it's part of um, test marketing their products. Okay, so that um, yeah. when they are a bit more ready, then we take them to a specialized phase. But when it comes to the specialized phase, um, we even don't do all the selection. A lot of, and the, much of the selection is done by the organizers. So they want to ensure that before your product gets to their market, it has been able to attain certain market requirements. Sometimes they are very, very high. And so um, last year, we went to one of such programs called Brunner Brothers. And I believe that Valerie may talk about it because her company was there and it was a very good program for us. It's about one of the biggest events um, for the hair industry, natural cosmetics and all that. And we had planned to go this year, but of course we couldn't go because of COVID. But it's in our plans to attend um, whenever um, the opportunity comes for us. And it's a good platform for those in the cosmetics industry to um, meet buyers and to also um, find what the market is doing. Uh, another program is also, um, apart from Brunner Brothers, um, 
Uh, I also saw that the Middle East is also a growing market for natural ingredients sure. from the, um, the statistics from um, Denzel. And so um, two times already, we have, it's called the Middle East uh, Organic Products Expo. And uh, we have found out that it's a very good platform for um, the industry. And so here again, um, when the spotters go and they come back, we work with them to help them to put their products, you know, um, in their mainstream market. And uh, one of the areas that we're also going to go in the Middle East was going to be Qatar, because we have done some research and realized that um, they, they, because of their weather, weather conditions and um, natural ingredients, particularly the share and um, the cocoa butter are good products that they use. In that um, some people we know, they come here informally to come and take them abroad, so I mean to Qatar. And so we together with the Ghana mission then um, are going to go there. And wow. now we, I think we'll be targeting um, when the World Cup, I think 2022, during the World Cup. And right. to, um, kind of um, expose the product to that market. And so when we oh. come back and um, we work with the exporters to help them to put their products in their mainstream markets. Last All year right. when we went to brothers, we realized that um, one good way, and I also saw it from Denzel's uh, presentation of being able to export all the time is to have your product online. We know the challenges we have in Ghana trying to put our products online, but we know it is um, something we cannot run away from. And so um, we supported, or we worked together with one of the companies that we went to Buena Brothers with to um, work with, Am with Walmart to put their products in, on Amazon, okay? But going forward, that was on a on pilot basis. Going forward, um, we want to do more on a larger scale where right. products that have already met the market's um, uh, requirements are, 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 are supported to be put into key markets like um, Walmart, um, through Amazon or any other search platforms that may come up. I have so many other things, but um, if I have to stop here for now to let yes. it yeah, yes. continue, I would wait for another turn. Thank you very much, Mrs. AJ Sam, for your contribution. Johnson. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for having me. And uh, we, let me just put on record that we work a lot with the uh, GEPA. And so, Mr. Jisam is uh, uh, is my mother as well. So we'll be working a lot together. Um, yeah. So quick, quickly, um, for those who uh, may not know much about AGI. So AGI is the is the biggest uh, private sector association in Ghana, uh, with over two thousand uh, members. Um, whilst we are talking about the cosmetics uh, sector, and um, we have about twenty three sectors. Okay, so we have food, we have beverages, we have agribusiness, and so on and so forth. And the toiletries and cosmetic sector is one of the sectors that we have uh, at AGI. And um, if you look at the statistics, uh, they don't form a very big um, chunk of our membership, but uh, quite significant anyway. So if you look at our membership, um, the, the, the beverages and uh, food processing and so on and so forth, they, they are forming about 39% of our membership. And we have about 4% forming the cosmetics uh, sector. And what we do um, with them is to ensure that the market, uh, so both macro and microeconomics is, is good. Uh, we are doing a lot of um, advocacy on their behalf. So, you know, the difficulty that we have uh, at the ports, uh, when issues of VAT uh, come in, when government wants to generate a revenue at the ports and is going to affect uh, industry adversely and so on and so forth. When they are bringing in machinery, uh, when they are bringing in raw materials and so on and so forth, what are the duties and so on and, 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 and so forth. So that is what AGI uh, uh, does to advocate on their behalf to ensure that um, they are able to do business and become competitive on the market. Number two is uh, capacity building. Okay, so at the business development department, what we do is to develop capacity for these members. Um, Denzel uh, said it right, okay? We are talking about share, we are talking about palm oil. Um, most of the cosmetic products that we are having are having so much base. So if you look at the R&D or, or the profile of cosmetics that we have, you can have as much as about 
60 to 70 percent of the base material and then the 30 percent you're talking about other ingredients if you look critically at that in the formulation profiles you realize that we are not using a lot of the things or the a lot of the uh, essential oils and and the raw materials that we have abundant in ghana and it's one of the things that we are looking up to uh, work on as we we work together to actually bring knowledge up as to how the 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 uh, the, the, the benefits of these uh, raw materials that we have abundant in Ghana. So they will be able to mix a lot more of that into their formulations. So basically, uh, that is that. In terms of uh, supporting the Wacom project with information, um, you know, Denzel also nailed that right on, the, on his head. Um, I, I personally consult for external companies who would want to come in and set up cosmetic uh, companies or food companies and so on and so forth. And normally they need a lot of data, but data is scarce in, in, in Ghana. I mean, um, it is a difficult uh, situation. Even GEPA are supposed to have some data because they are working directly with the uh, exporters, but it is a very difficult one when it comes to cosmetics. I think for the food sector, it's much better. And so recently the Ministry of Trade was saying that if they think that we should rather work a lot more with uh, GCNet to look at the exports, you know, things that are going outside versus things coming uh, into the country as finished products, which we have started working on. Uh, we've not gotten very far, but it's something that we have to look into. We have a, a policy and research department who does a lot of research, but we've realized that research or data is not very um, uh, in vogue. It's not in vogue in Ghana, right? So you see companies, our multinational um, members like Unilever and the PZs and so on, they look for a lot of uh, information and AC Nielsen is doing a lot of that for them. But if at the ADR level we give, we, we do a lot of research, you don't have our members even coming for that research to do any uh, market uh, penetration or anything like that. So because the demand is not there, we don't have a lot of research on even the individual sectors, uh, other than to depend on the work that we are doing with uh, the st statistical um, services. Um, some of them we are doing with the World Economic Forum. Uh, we are doing a bit with Unido, for example, the value chain analysis that was done was very insightful, and we got a lot of information from there. However, we have capacity to be able to get this information. We have capacity to do the research for each of the sectors. And probably because the cosmetics is part of the Wacom project, and the cassava is part of the Wacom project, and also the fruit sector, we have to use this opportunity to start at this and make sure that we have solid information, the, the micro, the macro, um, the, the, the market sizes, the players in there, and so on and so forth. So that is one of the things that we can do. So we are prepared to help the Wacom project have that. And lastly, before you, you, you come in, um, Charles, yes, um, uh, we, we, <laughs> yes, I'm wrapping up. So just like Mr. Jisam said, uh, we also help with the export capacity of our members. So this year, for example, we've been to Cote d'Ivoire, okay? And we have Gandu, we had Gandu Cosmetics and other cosmetic companies going with us. And one of the things that we do is these fairs and exhibitions. GEPA does it more. But we also have uh, another angle, and sometimes we also um, coordinate with GEPA to ensure that our members go outside there to be able to showcase their, their product. But most importantly, and for those who are on the program and cosmetics, remember that the market in Ghana is so big. Most of the time we are looking externally, <laughs> but we have not been able to even uh, satisfy the market in Ghana. And so this is one of the things that I will challenge most of our local uh, cosmetic pro, uh, producers to do, to make sure that we get the market in Ghana field, get the money enough to be able to even launch outside into Europe and to, into the US. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Um, this is a J. Sam and then Johnson. Well, I'll come back to you in the energy field. Um, so at least we know we have to work a bit on data. We know we have to collaborate, build capacity in a certain market, and then work on getting data. Uh, Charles, and do you, can I quickly say something about that one? Sorry, very quickly. Please do. Very quickly, yeah. I just want to also let you know that um, at the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, um, we have another activity called um, Collection of Statistics. That's a non-traditional export statistics. And so, Johnson, we work very closely with the GCNet or we are on the GCNet 
platform, the, the, the statistics come to us directly. We are able okay. to assess it. And so each year, we produce the national exports and non-traditional export statistics called NTEs. Mm. And so mm. um, in 2018, from what we got from uh, the GCNet, uh, we saw that um, share oil or share nuts, we exported about $14.1 million. And then for share oils and all the, the other things, we had about um, $64.7 million. So uh, we got all these things from the forms that people complete to be able to do exports. And then mm. uh, maybe I also want to add that uh, in terms of information, um, you can also visit our market hub. We do a lot of market reports. There's a beautiful one on the share industry. And by August, September, we're also going to launch um, uh, something we call the Impact Hub, where mm. we we'll have it will be a one-stop one, uh, one shop for information on the export trade. And then we'll have other institutions like Ghana Standards Authority, Ghana Food and Drugs um, Authority. And I think there's a third company, a third institution also located in the Impact Hub. So that when exporters come and they are looking for information and they, they can get all there. But when it comes to having to test the products, then they'll go to those places. And I'm very happy to say that this is very much on course. And then by August, September, it will be launched so that we can support the exporters with um, strategic, strategic information for them to make um, decisions. So that is it for now. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Right. Jason, for that uh inside for information. So we would be coming to you and I guess the traffic will turn up and then we'll get all the necessary information. At this stage, we'll take a few questions that we have for Denzel and then we have uh, Valerie and then Senor coming, then we'll be wrapping up. Uh, so Denzel, there's a first question that somebody is asking. Does using natural fragrances from essential oils, lem like lemongrass, citronella, etc. Does it def uh, defy the term natural cosmetics? I mean, uh, the, obviously, if you use essential oils or any natural fragrance in a natural cosmetic, it's still a natural product, yes. So as long as you use any natural resin or gum or any other natural fragrant material, it could be, as I say, it could be a gum, resin, um, would would classify as natural and, and yes means that it's still a natural cosmetic yeah okay okay yes um there's only one question i think we would go to senor and then the, but then the, there's a question that goes to us uh, somebody is saying that it was a very insightful and very informative session whether we can have a second session we'll look at it and see where we missed other areas we'll get to denzel if he has the time and then we'll re-inform everybody and have that second insightful session. At this stage, we have two uh, of our own. We have two producers who want to tell us about the market potential for um, natural cosmetics. So may I respectfully ask uh, Valerie and then Senor to please turn on their cameras. They were with us in the beginning. Uh, they took a backstage, so they are here with us to also tell us. So Senor, please, what can you tell us about about the export market, the export potential for natural cosmetics. So you go first. Okay, so in terms of uh, export okay. potential. To keep it hello? brief. Hello, can you hear Yes, I can hear you. To keep it brief and in context, tell us the natural, the potential and for what you are doing from your perspective as Tama. So let's have it in that context. You have five minutes, please. Thank you. All right, thank you. So as you know, uh, Tama is a, it's all natural cosmetic product. Uh, we started in 2011 and uh, we were out to sell purely 100% natural product. So all our ingredients that we use are certifiable organic as well. And we make most of our product from organic uh, shea butter. Now the challenge uh, we have had it's all about uh, quality of uh, raw material that we have to secure uh, locally over here. And uh, our main challenge is the local market for all natural personal care products. Even though a lot of people love to use all natural products, organic products, but 
I must say that producing natural products are more expensive than producing artificial products uh, because uh, these natural products actually deliver uh, better results and uh, they are not easily uh, used also in, in formulation. We have had a lot of challenge to be able to put our natural product Tama on the EU cosmetic portal. I must say that uh, we are one of the few companies uh, from West Africa who have successfully completed the product information file to be able to uh, achieve this uh, uh, success. But I would say the market for natural cosmetic products is huge in Africa. Because in Africa, we like to use very natural products. We've been using natural products. But once you put into a formula, it becomes uh, over the, 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 the purchasing capacity of the average person in, in Africa. So we have found that uh, to be able to sell very effectively, we have to just stick to very, very formal, high-end uh, distribution channels like the malls, like the supermarket. But we have good market externally, especially in Europe, Germany, where we are currently doing uh, an aggressive market entry strategy and promoting our products there in, uh, in Germany with some very good distributors. We have interest. Uh, we have also attained the certification of Canada Health Authority. So Tama is also registered with the Canada Health Authority. And this market, we are, we are seeing a, a lot of growth over there. In the Middle East also, there are a lot of interest, but the purchasing power for most of them who are selling in the informal distribution channel uh, is just like uh, West African uh, purchasing power. They want to buy it as cheap as possible and uh, packaging is not so attractive in their informal distribution channel, which is also very huge. Uh, but if you really want to do um, grow a natural personal care, you have to be focusing more on the spas. We supply a lot of products to a couple of spas locally. Uh, we, we sell to uh, companies who want to do business in a more structured way, but it's very difficult to compete with the artificial product in the open market here. Thank you very much, uh, Senor. A quick one before you move on. Talking about all the certification, how were you able to get around it? Yeah, so we, we have been uh, growing our cosmetic product alongside our commodity trading product when we started. And right. so we were, we were able to generate income to finance our certification. Again, we are one of the few people who got uh, Shea Butter certified uh, organic. And I personally, when we started, there was nothing. I mean, it's just, you were just swimming in every problem. Poor quality, raw material. And we, or let's say, yes, my company, CCAF, has to uh, invest in R&D to be able to develop raw materials that can be used directly in formulation without compromising the quality. We did that for Shear, we did that for Neem, we, need, we did that for, for Baobab oil. And so we use a very high end, uh, very high quality raw material that we have developed internally. For instance, we brought down the free fatty acid in shear nuts from 8% to below 1%. So we could use it in the formulation without refining it. I mean, these are very, very difficult things to do. And uh, we also have to shoulder the building of our industry. I mean, there are not many people at the time we started. And so we were very active to promote the Ghana Association of Share Nuts uh, Dealers, the Global Share Al Alliance. And uh, what we are looking forward to doing, and now that we have a lot more actors in the industry, we should be looking at uh, bringing together all natural cosmetic uh, uh, personal care producers to be able to form an association, and then we'll have uh, industry strength and grow this industry. All right. I think that's a take home for Wacom. We'll see how we engage with you and the other natural cosmetic producers to see how we can help drive this. Thank you very much, Senor. So, Valerie, it's nice having you with us. Can you please tell us a bit about R&L and um, luxury and then uh, how you also survive with all these natural products? Thank you. Thank you, Charles, for the introduction. Um, thank you, everyone who has 
been on the panel so far. Denzel, you're a font of information. I've learned so much and taken so many notes during this. And um, to Auntie Agnes, you know, thank you. I know Auntie Agnes very well. She's been such a help in terms of exportation. And um, Mr. Johnson, this is my first time hearing from you. So I'm great. I'm looking forward to hearing more. And um, of course, my senior, senior, he's my, he's my mentor in this business. So, you know, he, I started because of him, actually, because of his product. So I'm really, really grateful to hear from him. And I'm following his progress, as he knows very well. Um, so thank you. I'm Valerie Obazi, and I'm the CEO and founder of a brand called R&R Luxury. We specialize in finished skincare products, value-added skincare products made from our raw materials from Ghana, such as Sheer, Sheer Oil specifically, actually was our first product. And then we've developed a few other products along the lines of the natural ingredients. And one of the ones that Denzel mentioned was Baobab, which again, I was introduced to and is an awesome, awesome um, raw material that can be used straight up as a cosmetic as well. So we started officially in 2010 when I was living in Lagos in Nigeria. I would just given birth to my first daughter. About six months after giving birth to her, I was actually introduced in Ghana to shea butter as a liquid, which is the shea oil, which had come from the Tama shea butter village. And um, I was introduced to it by my mother and she was like, oh, look, you can get shea butter in its liquid form. It's so good. And um, for me, it was a... Um, a crossover moment because I thought that you can have such a wonderful raw material in the liquid form which makes it easy to use which means it has marketability in local as well as international markets. I have a branding and PR background so I immediately saw the opportunities with it and I was put in touch with Senyo who was able to send me a sample and it kind of started from there. For me I wanted something natural for my baby skin and my whole family and um, this was the perfect solution to that. And that is how we started. Um, it, the, the sheer oil itself has developed so much over the past 10 years since we started. And we've been in the market in Ghana probably for the past like four to five years, which has been a very interesting development for us. Initially, we were building our brand in Lagos, Nigeria, which you know, for Africa, Nigeria is really the hub of trends for the rest of Africa. And a lot of people from outside of Africa also look to Nigeria for what is happening in terms of music, fashion, movies, you know, they have the huge Nollywood industry. The fashion industry is in Nigeria is probably the, the best one in Africa. And of course, now look at the music industry, what's happening in the creative industry in Nigeria is, is a really fantastic thing to look at. So I was actually grateful to start my business there because so many people got to experience my product and also got to hear about it because we were based in Lagos. Um, initially, when I started, I thought it would be a wholesale and export product. But to my surprise, you know, the Nigerian market was really open to it. So we ended up opening a store there in the center of Lagos, well, on the island, which is, I guess, what you consider the more like upmarket side of the city. And we opened a store there in 2013, and the store is still open now to this day. We've just grown it a little bit since then. And um, we started building a name for ourselves on social media. Actually, Instagram was a key part of letting people know what our product was and how to get it. And, you know, we experienced various different blips and experiences along the way but um from lagos we now moved to came to ghana ghana is my background i'm ghanaian and so it was the natural progression for me and also all of our raw materials were sourced from ghana so it only made sense to also make our product available here and then south africa came along again informally and online and we have a retail partner there who's an online retailer then i grew up in London, in the UK. And so that was a natural progression for me as well. I'm in London quite often. So I um, have our website there, which fulfills to the UK and Europe. And then the US market for me was, I always knew it was a market that we were intended for, but um, last year we invested and spent a lot of time in the US at not only trade shows through the likes of GEPA and the Global Shea Alliance, which is amazing. You have to make sure that you're registered with these kind of associations so that you have the opportunity to learn and also grow. And um, we also did some consumer shows like the Essence Fest, which they had two, one in April in New York, which was purely about beauty. And then their main event, which was in July in New Orleans, which is more than beauty, it's 
everything, but they have like 300,000 people who descend on New Orleans to attend the Essence Fest. And part of it is a, um, is a huge marketplace that is on for three days. And we were there and we really got to get some feedback from the US market, the African American and um, Black African um, segment, which they, I, I really, really believe the natural cosmetics from Africa is a, has a huge potential in that market because it's very important for the African Americans and Black Americans to buy from Africa and to support Black owned businesses. And next here is women owned businesses as well. So we kind of tick all of those boxes, which was a real eye opener for us. And um, it, it's been great. The reception has been great. Now, the next question most people ask me is how did you get there? You know, what were the challenges you faced? The reality is that you learn as you go with this business. If you don't have a formulation or manufacturing or chemical chemistry background, you're learning from people or learning from the internet or learning from sources as you go along. For me, one of the main challenges is that the information is not there. You know, you can't, you have to go out and find it yourself. There's no, with every new market we go into, there's lots of regulation and lots of compliance that you have to, that you have to meet. And it's not easy to find, even on the internet, it's really not easy to find. There needs to be a source where this information is all grouped together. I'm compiling it as I go. And I think that there's potential there for me to share that information with up and coming brands that have come up in the past few years who have absolutely no idea. The informal sector is huge. That's why I think that there's a lack of data as well, because the data doesn't exist because, or the data is scarce, as was said earlier, because the informal sector is what is raging, not the formal sector. Brands like mine, our products were on the shelf long before we had any kind of certification. Even if we were working on certification in the background, our products were still getting into the market via e-commerce, shops, one-to-one -one sales, you know, that type of thing. And then also exporting and leaving the country. It's not necessarily leaving via GCNet, which actually now is, um, is no longer. There's now a system called ICOMS, which has taken over GCNet. So for me, a lot of my products are not marked on the GCNet platform, if I'm 100% honest, because what's happening is that it's maybe leaving, some products are leaving by DHL. Hello, Valerie. I think we've lost her, or oh, she's frozen. But can, yes, yeah, so the others can hear me. Okay, I think she was about wrapping up. In the meantime, Denzel, there are a few questions uh, I'm going to direct to you and also to um, Ante Agi. So, Ante Agi, the first question is if somebody wants to register with GEPA, how do you go about it? Um, for us, um, all we need from you is um, ensure that you have formalized your business. And so first of all, you have to register with the Ghana, um, with the Registrar General's Department, and then you come to us with proof of your registration, and then which must also have a tax identification number. And then you just take um, 100, sorry, 200 Ghana CDs from you for the whole year. And so first of all, a registered business, and then a tax identification number and then 200 Ghana cities. So that's all you, you are you required to register with us as an exporter. And then let me quickly add again, if I may, that um, we work with uh, other institutions or uh, projects like the ITC, the International Trade Center, and they have a project called She Trades Commonwealth, and we are one of their key collaborators. And so through this, we identify new exporters and then we mainstream them into the regular export portfolio. And then, so we want to encourage you. I've seen that the coordinator is also, and that uh, uh, Regina, she's also participating. We encourage you to register with us. Then you go and then sign up on the Sheet Trades program mm -hmm. because Share is one of the products that they are, they are promoting. And then we, we do a lot of work with them. When we went to Dubai last year, um, they supported us with the um, setup of our, of, our, of our booth. And so, um, also with the ITC, we have another project um, ongoing currently called um, Trade for Sustainable Development. Two models have been done already. The first model was on uh, resource efficiency. The ongoing one is on um, voluntary standards. And then the last one is on product uh, branding and positioning. And so we encourage you to come to us and 
see whether it's not too late to sign up on it because it will help you to brand your product and to put it on the export market. And as I said, we are doing it together with the International Trade Center. So um, we are all invited to come. Thank you. Thank you. Valerie, your closing yeah. remarks. You were, you were just about okay. right when you went up. So you yeah. can please go ahead. I was. Um, sorry, what I was saying is that the informal sector is very much huge and is probably going to take a large chunk of what those numbers, the data that is really required for exporting, etc. And I, I have so much more to say, of course, I can't take up the whole time. And so hopefully we'll get another opportunity to share. But I love it when I'm asked to come and be kind of a success story and speak about successful brands coming out of Africa or Ghana. But you know, we still feel that we have a long way to go because there is so much more to cosmetics and being a successful exporter. But I think it's very important that we continue to grow, that we continue to have brands and cosmetics and value added products that are coming out of Africa, producing here, not just taking the raw materials from here and producing abroad. And we need to develop the sector in terms of adding value addition at the, um, at the ground level and look at how we can um, we can do the refinement of many of our raw materials. There's so many raw materials that we don't even touch. And so shear is huge, but it also, we have to go beyond shear and see what other products that we can be producing at the, um, at the, at that end of the value chain and then grow the business. And one other important thing that we need to do is have formulators. We're all making the same products because we only have the natural raw you know, oils and fats that are available to us and making products from that. But if we don't have the scientists, the people that are experienced in cosmetic formulation, that is all that we're going to produce. So we need to have schools or whether it's vocational schools or in our actual universities that are teaching people how to formulate cosmetics because those people will have a job the minute they leave school because it's, it's seriously lacking. So I'm 10 years down the line, but we're still producing products that have such a low barrier to entry because we're only using our everyday sheer, baobab, black soap. It's not, you know, it's not a big deal. We've built a brand, but at the end of the day, we'd like to do more sophisticated products like my dear Denzel said, so that we can really, really compete in the international market. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for listening. I hope I didn't talk for too long. Oh, thank you. That's, that's good. I think it's very insightful telling us about it. Um, Denzel, there is a, a question on uh, Ayurvedic cosmetics. That where do, uh, do it feature? Does it feature as a natural cosmetic or something? Because somebody didn't hear about it. Your microphone is off, please. Ayurvedic cosmetics. Yes. It's a good example of... Um, the use of traditional medicine, the bridge between traditional medicine, which is Indian medicine, and the cosmetic industry has been developed in India. It's still very young, um, but it's important. But actually, the biggest sector, which I didn't mention back at time, is halal. Halal cosmetics are actually a much bigger section than Ayurvedic cosmetics, which is Islamic cosmetics which are of using products which are halal, as you know, which are uh, available, which are allowed in, in, in the Quran. So um, both are important, but actually the, probably the bigger market or the bigger area is to, to have a look at that, the Malaysian market, the Indonesia, these countries that develop halal cosmetics, and it's very fast growing. But Ayurvedic, meds, Ayurvedic cosmetics are there. There is definitely an interest both in America, where there are a lot of Indians, and in India, of course. Okay. Um, I have a, a question. Um, these are really no questions, but let me just take it. Nadia, I've seen your, your, your comments. Um, yes, I usually we're using a Q&A, so I didn't really notice your hands. But then she also wants us to have a follow-up uh, discussion and look at opportunities available to promote approaches to eco-industrial parks. I think our friend Senor is an environmentalist. That is what he drives him to make sure we have a lot of these things. So we will take it up. I think behind the scenes, uh, Nadia will get in touch with you. We have your details and we will look at these uh, opportunities as well. The last one is that uh, she wants clarification. The Denzel uh, 
Charles? No. Okay. Uh, Charles froze, so let me take it up from here. Um, yeah. Uh, Charles was asking Denzil on behalf of, uh, of um, one of the participants, uh, you were saying that any shea butter that has essential oil like um, lemongrass has failed its quality of natural. I mean, you were saying that he provided that the essential oil is natural oil, then the product can be considered as a, a natural product. And people are, uh, one of the participants is saying that um, what we call natural shea butter. Is it the natural raw butter processed from nuts only? Then this is a little uh, problematic and 80% of cosmetics on the market would not be considered natural and probably not even Tama's products. So if you can uh, maybe answer this a bit provocative question. Uh, it's a very... In Am I there? Is that it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, it's a very important question because it, it is a, f a fact that many people who claim that they're making cosmetic, natural cosmetic, the, the case with shea is very important. Um, most shea that comes onto the market in Europe has been refined in some way or other. And in order to remove the impurities, so it has a, a long shelf life. Because in Ghana, nobody matters whether the shelf life of their shea is only a month or so. They just buy new shea. You know, it's, it's not a big issue. They'll throw it out or they'll use it because there's lots there. It's relatively cheap. But if you're a European formulator, you, you need to have a six month shelf life. You cannot use the product. So you will find that the vast majority of shea is processed using not all shea, if you, but a lot of the shea that is on the market in Europe is actually butter, natural, 100% natural shea, nuts, making shea, which has then been refined using chemicals in the refining process. Obviously, this is not allowed in organic. So if you're claiming that you're making an organic cosmetic with shea, you still want it refined but you will be, you have to use a, a mechanical process. And um, so, and, and this is available. There are people out there making organic, refined organic cosmetics, and you will find Savannah Fruits and all these others and Tama Aseka, their product is refined. Uh, I think it's all refined abroad. It's not, I mean, unfortunately, there is now some refining going on in Africa, but before, 10 years ago, it was all refined. Every single shea butter cosmetic you saw in Europe or America had been refined somewhere else, either using chemicals or, as I say, using a mechanical um, process. And I was involved in a project in Buipe trying to see if we could do it in Ghana um, because that was a, a mission of mine and a various group of other people. So I'm very aware of this thing. But, uh, that's the situation. Thank you. Maybe Senyo, you would like to come up on this because you are directly <laughs> called into the into the intervention. Yeah. Okay. So uh, for us in Africa, it's very easy to process 100% uh, organic uh, uh, personal care product. I mean, what we have to do, like we do at SICAF, is to pay attention more on the post-harvest activities of these raw materials. So you get, uh, you get the raw material in their unrefined form, which does not need any refining before you formulate. Uh, most of the CICAP products are 100% uh, organic, or less not organic, uh, I would say natural. And when we say natural, we're looking at the natural definition as in the EU cosmetic uh, regulation. Uh, it's not because we are calling it natural or we have used it as natural. We, call it, we are saying natural because it fits the EU uh, regulations on the definition for natural. Uh, for instance, uh, our shear oil for body is all natural uh, shear oil, and then we use uh, uh, essential oils. And these essential oils are coming from plant source, and there is no preservative inside. Our black soap is also all 100% natural. There is no artificial uh, chemical inside. 
However, when we use uh, uh, water to mix with this uh, natural ingredients, because you need to preserve it, uh, you have to get some artificial preservatives. Unfortunately, the natural preservatives themselves are not strong enough to preserve themselves. So you are compelled to use some artificial preservatives. But again, the preservatives that we use are very safe. Uh, they are safer than the natural preservatives for you. And they have been approved by EcoCert. EcoCert is an international authority on uh, this uh, uh, matters. So we use only EcoCert approved uh, artificial ingredients when it becomes necessary to use. Excellent. Thank you very much, Senio. And there is also a, a one of the participants that is saying that it's important to stress out always that semi-transformation upgrade can make really the difference in the business model. And I think that in your, in your case and having visited your premises in Tamale, this is really what makes the difference also, no? And uh, the investment in uh, and the research done in how to improve the process is, um, is really is really strategic as you highlighted before. Um, we have still many questions, but I think we also have to, to wrap up. Uh, there is one uh, to Denzil that maybe we could uh, uh, add into the report. Denzil today prepared this, uh, this presentation, but there will be a full-fledged report that will be also uploaded on our Wacom Ghana website. So you, for those that want to get into more details, um, they could also find this um, in the next few weeks. Uh, uh, the report should be available. And one of the um, of the participants is asking if um, you mentioned uh, many essential oils and many uh, other um, ingredients that are available in in Ghana and in Africa, such as moringa and baobab. And maybe if you have any idea that could be uh, of organizations that could uh, uh, become a provider for uh, these ingredients that would be that would be perfect to be added into the report. Uh, yeah, suppliers, sorry, yeah. you want to know where they can get it from. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there are lots of suppliers in Europe of these raw materials. Yeah, so yeah. this could be added as an annex. There's one in the, South Africa. The there's, only one, there's one Africlex, there's one company in South Africa which has a lot of interesting but there are not many, unfortunately, who make in ingredients. Yeah. And then maybe the last one to close, uh, um, again, to GEPA, uh, is should the product be FDA compliant to be registered at GEPA? Yeah, um, sometimes, um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, um, ideally, yes. Um, it is a, it's something we do simultaneously, um, it's like the chicken and egg case. And uh, you come to us, you have the intention to export, and we, we want you to be able to put the products on the export market. So you have to go to FDA to get it um, certified. But in the meantime, um, if there are other you know, platforms, particularly local platforms, where you could begin the test marketing, we encourage you to do so. Because... Um, if the product is not FDA certified, the market outside will not want to patronize it. And so um, you don't necessarily have to have the FDA certificate before you come. It could be in the process of getting it. That is why we, our impact hub is going to have FDA as a key part of the process. So when you come, they're also there to talk to you and to help you to quickly get the FDA certification. And so without that one, um, it would be difficult for us to take you on our trade shows, but you can still register with us whilst you rectify your FDA and GSA certification. Okay. Yeah, uh, Valerie would like to intervene on this also. Thank you, Ebe. And um, I wanted to add to that because the question of asking whether you need to be FDA approved before getting GEPA approval, is good to know that GEPA can help you get your FDA, but the issue is not, I don't think it's very difficult to get your FDA certification if you're following good manufacturing practice. And there's lots of information out there on how you can improve in this respect. Now with GEPA, it'd be really, really um, useful if 
um, having Ghana FDA doesn't mean that you're able to be accepted in the export market. Each market has its own compliance and regulation. So if GEPA are helping brands with exporting, it would be very, very useful if we can get the guidelines for each market on what we, is required. Which is, I learned one of the um, shows that we went to with GEPA last year was the um, Expo East in Baltimore. And they refused to accept specific brands if your labeling did not comply with the FDA of America, which is again, it's not that you don't get approval for FDA in America, but you do get regulated. So what they do is they require that pharm um, cosmetics do not make pharmaceutical claims, i.e. helps with stretch marks or helps with acne. You can't say those kind of things if you're a cosmetic, unless you are going to pharmaceutical, then you'd have to get pharmaceutical approval. So I only learned that through going on this show with um, GEPA. So if once we register with GEPA as a cosmetic, it would be great to get a breakdown of regulation for each and every market that we are targeting so that we go through the process before you even take any of the brands to those markets. Because FDA Ghana does not mean approval for FDA America or EU compliance, etc. So if we can get this kind of information laid out, I know that's a whole new job, but you know, it would be awesome for brands like myself and newer brands coming up. Thank That's you very it. much, Valerie. And thank you for also um, introducing so well our next webinar, which should be on <laughs> regulations for uh, exporters in the cosmetic sector. We are currently running this, we were running this analysis of the market potential with Denzil, and we are also now running a parallel analysis on the um, uh, market requirements uh, for uh, cosmetic producers for uh, Europe, for uh, the States and also for the Middle East. And this should be broadcasted at the beginning of uh, August. We are still fin finalizing the date of the, of the webinar, but please follow us on our website and social media and we will make sure that you all will be informed about, uh, about this. There were also a series of questions on how Wacom can support producers to get together, to work together, to enhance the, the production and the quality of the products. And this is exactly the aim of the, of the program. Uh, we are currently working supporting AGI to set up a um, cosmetic platform hub, online platform hub to show the world that Ghana can produce high quality cosmetic products. And this uh, is something that we are um, currently uh, working on with, uh, with Johnson. So this will also be one of the uh, aspects on which we will be directly supporting the cosmetic industry in Ghana. In parallel to this, we are working uh, with our uh, cluster expert uh, locally, Na Ache, um, on strengthening the collaboration among different producers uh, of raw material, but also processors of small uh, and medium enterprises processors, so that we can um, enhance the quality of their product so that we can accompany them to certify their product uh, at FDA and to register them at GSA and make them um, capable of accessing the market. Uh, in parallel to this, we uh, also work uh, uh, hand in hand with, uh, with GEPA um, to support uh, the Ghana Export Promotion Authority to provide services to the companies that um, require their services. And for this, for example, we supported GEPA to develop the export readiness checkers, which is now available on, the, on their website, on the platform, on the market hub of GEPA, where you can also have a feeling of where do you position yourself? No? We, want to, we all want to export, but then there are some pre-requirements that you need to uh, to have to be able to export and uh, uh, we will definitely be working with GEPA to also identify which could be the good uh, exhibition and fairs and international business to business uh, events where uh, Ghanaian companies could uh, broadcast and show um, their products. So there is a whole set of, of um, assist, technical assistance that we can provide and this is just uh, uh, an appetizer of, uh, of what uh, we will be doing in the next um, uh, three years. Uh, it's been uh, on, on behalf of the Wacom team and on, of Charles that had to leave us uh, for a technical problem. Uh, it's 
it's been a pleasure to be with you today. <laughs> thank you, Charles, to, to be back. Um, I would like to thank uh, uh, Denzel for having guided us through uh, the market potential, Senio and Valerie for their uh, passionate testimonial and uh, for their uh, success and best practices, Agnes for being so welcoming uh, from GEPA to, to all the participants and Johnson who we cannot see but uh, has been with us throughout. So thank you all for participating and uh, to Charles for the closing remark. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, Today, I mean, yes. So we thank you so much. Uh, tell, uh, tell uh, Ebe that I'm, I'm here. I can see her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, Ebe Johnson is there. Yeah, he, he can see you. So it'd be nice having all of you. It's traveled a bit longer than we anticipated, but I guess the information we, we received so much. And so we thank you again. We can't thank all of you enough. For Denzel, we say, Brilliant for all the other ones. We thank Ebe for thanking everybody. For our participants, we're very grateful. And as you have said, we'll look at the other opportunity. The regulations is coming up. We'll announce the date. So please follow us on Facebook. Welcome. Go to our, work, uh, our, our media handles, all our social media handles, Welcome Ghana. Go to our website, welcomeghana.org. Upcoming events, you will find everything that is coming. The regulations is important. We want you all to get to know. We thank mm -hmm. all of you to get in touch with our experts, uh, Joseph for cassava, um, Frank for fruits, and this everything cosmetics is now at a, yes, she would help you and she would talk to you. And we believe within the next three years, we would contribute to the development in the cosmetic sector and it will not be the same as we came to meet in terms of quality products, in terms of data and everything. We hope to contribute to this. So thank you so much. Have a nice weekend, stay safe, and then we meet for the next webinar. Thank you all. Bye-bye.